Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito What's happening, night fans? Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon with you here alongside Eric Lopez, as usual. Eric, what's going on, brother? It's going. It's a busy week. We got softball starting, so I'm doing my prep work and uh, basketball, uh, big, big, big basketball week as well. So lots going on. Busy um, busy week for all sports here. We got a lot to talk about. We got men's basketball. We got women's basketball. <clears throat> Our big uh, interview this week, we're talking with head coach Renee Lures Gillespie of UCF softball. They're starting their season uh, on uh, Friday, uh, Friday afternoon. Five games in a tournament this weekend. We'll both be there to start things off. Of course, baseball's getting underway not too long after that. We've got tennis. We've got golf. We've got a little bit of everything this week. So make sure you follow us at UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter. You can follow me at Jeff underscore Sharon. You can follow Eric at Eric Lopez Elo. You can hit us up on Facebook at Black and Gold Banneret and blackandgoldbanneret.com. And also, subscribe to our podcast if you don't already on iTunes, Google Play, uh, SoundCloud, and TuneIn. Leave us a rating on iTunes as well. Tell us how we're doing, and don't be afraid to reach out to us for any questions. All right. Um, let's talk basketball. Of course, women's basketball got off to a very good uh, start tonight. We'll talk about that in a little bit as they had a blowout win over Houston. It was a big basketball night for UCF. The men's team, however, um, they were on the road facing a ranked Cincinnati team. It's 11th in the country. Very good team coming in, undefeated in the American. And you, and Cincinnati just kept us at arm's length uh, throughout the game. Final tally was 60-50 to 50, uh, up at Fifth Third Arena uh, in the Queen City. UCF never got any closer than five points in the second half. And then it just seemed like you know Cincinnati just stuck their arm out and stiff-armed us the rest of the way. Um, for UCF, Leading scores, 14 points each for B.J. Taylor and Taco Fall. Taco with another great game, double-double, 14 and 11, 7 for 7 from the field uh, and a pair of blocks. B.J., uh, 5 of 13 from the field, did not hit a 3, uh, 14 points, 5 rebounds, and only one assist. A.J. Davis had four assists to lead UCF, but uh, it was uh, Cincinnati in back of Kyle Washington who, was, uh, who had a nice game, 6 of 13 from the field, 14 points. Uh, Troy Copain did not have a very good game. That's how UCF really stayed in it. They held him to 2 of 12 from the field and 1 of 7 from uh, three-point distance. He only scored five points, but uh, Washington picked up the slack in 33 minutes, had a double-double on the, with the 14 and 11 to match Taco Fall. And like I said, it was, you know, this, was, this felt like one of those games where you know, these two teams play on this floor 10 times. You know, Cincinnati's going to win nine of those times, but this was one of those nights when it felt like the way they were playing, we could have gotten them that 10% time, right? And the shots just weren't falling for UCF when they needed to. Um, and the Knights finished 39% from the field, 19 of 48. Um, shot well from the line, but did not shoot well from three-point distance, only three out of 15. And the Bearcats now 11th in the country, like we said, 21-2, and 10-0 and in the league. Joe Lenardi has them projected as a four seed. Um, and SMU, which is ranked 25th at 20 and 4, 10 and 1, he has them as a seven seed right now. But um, Cincinnati right now is the class of the league, Eric, and uh, they showed it tonight. Yeah, they are until uh, this weekend now. They got to go to SMU this weekend. So that'll be interesting to see how oh, they that's match be up. A great but, game. Uh, oh. Yeah. But, I mean,. I thought the start of halves were the difference in this game. Since he jumped on him right at the get-go from the beginning of the game, UCF didn't score, I think, nearly until almost four minutes into the game. 
Uh, and then UCF fought back to kind of get it close there at the half. And then Cincinnati opened with a run early in the second half. Johnny Dawkins had to spend a multiple timeouts. And uh, like you said, they kind of kept them at arms, uh, arm's length from that point on. So um, just Cincinnati's really good. That's a tough team to play. You got to certainly be at your best. Very interesting. AJ Davis doesn't start, comes off the bench tonight uh, in this game against Cincinnati. Uh, so, you know, start tweaking some things there, but, uh, you know, it was a good effort. Taco played very well. Uh, nothing to be ashamed of. They just, yeah. I mean, they lost to the best team in the league by, you know, so that a lot of teams are doing that. Yeah. That's why Cincinnati is the best team in the league is because, you know, they did not play well and found a way to win anyway. You know, consider that, you know, I mentioned that we shot, uh, 39 point, you know, just under 40% from the field. Cincinnati was 35%, 23 to 65 and uh, 9 of 29 from three-point range. That really turned out to be the difference was that, you know, plus six points on the th- in the, in the three-point uh, three category. 29 attempts from beyond the arc, which is a lot for them. Uh, they also, we, uh, UCF also out-rebounded them 36 to 34, although Cincinnati had the advantage in offensive rebounds at 13 to 7. And assists, Cincinnati out-assisted UCF 19 to 8, which... You know, shows me that they were willing to create shots for, um, for their teammates. You know, it wasn't all about, um, you know, what their usual, you know, the usual suspects. You know, you, you mentioned Troy Copain, um, who you know, who did, like I said, did not have a very good game uh, shooting the ball, but he did um, lead or was tied for the team lead for Cincinnati in assists with six. Jacob Evans had had an, had six assists as well. Jaron Cumberland at four. So when I see those assist numbers up and the shooting's not going well, that tells me that, you know, obviously they were getting offensive rebounds and they were trying to find open looks for whoever could actually make something. And, uh, and, and if you're Johnny Dawkins' team, that's, that's a team that you look, at, you look at this film and you're like, that's where we want to get to. Because right now, you know, if UCF doesn't play a good game, they're going to lose that game. Cincinnati did not play well and they won. Yeah, I mean, they got to get off to good starts. I mean, I go back to uh, Saturday when UCF knocked off Memphis, jumped out to a 13 nothing lead and, and played from ahead and played with confidence. And when you don't have a lot of depth, you really don't want to dig yourself a hole. And that's what they had to do all night. It seemed like they were trying to fight uh, from a big hole, but uh, they, you know, they competed. And uh, it's a good effort. Now they got to turn their attention to a UConn team that's, uh, I think it's got to, you know, starting to make some grounds here. They've had a ton of injuries. But as we saw when they first played earlier in the year in UConn, UConn still has got some abilities here, some fight. And this will be a battle Saturday with uh, UConn coming to town. So uh, I think Coach Doc, it's got to be also disappointed. Didn't really turn since, uh, you know, the turnovers in the second half. They protected the ball, I thought, in the first half. I think they only had six turnovers in the first half. That kind of uh, jumped up a little bit more in the second half. Also, that didn't help them in their cause in the comeback in the second half. Yeah, I'm looking at um, the standings right now. UCF at six and six in the league, which is actually in sixth place, uh, fifteen and nine overall. And some of the other action that went up, by the way, it, it, UConn, by the way, beat USF um, in uh, in Connecticut by forty. Was it forty six points tonight? Is that right? That's up to like that. Oh I'm God, sure they, they, they. Well, we know who the worst team in the league is, so. <laughs> Wow, I mean that's uh, that's boy, it's just it's just all coming apart for for for. Well, it's been coming apart for a while, and uh, I don't think it's going to get better anytime soon. But you know, you know, from our perspective here, looking at UCF, you know, you know, still sixth place in the conference, you're still in the hunt. You know, you're still obviously there to get into the conference tournament. Um, Fifteen and nine, six and six, though it's. It's kind of like, ah, you know, you had that you, you had that good start, then the four straight losses. The win over Memphis was big, really big on Saturday, I thought, the way they bounced back and they beat the Tigers by 15 points. And, you know, we're not giving enough, um, you know, a- enough props to Johnny Dawkins' team for that win. But, you know, just quickly to recap, um, Knights did jump out all over Memphis in the first half, up by 17 at the break. Um, and, uh, you know, as, you know, Dedrick Lawson was 6 of 20 for Memphis for uh, 10 points. But... Uh, the star for, uh, or, or excuse me, for uh, 28 points for Memphis, excuse me, to go with 10 rebounds. But he was pretty much it for the Tigers because they shot 27% in the first half. And UCF, meanwhile, uh, shot up over 50% uh, for the entire game uh, and led by uh, Matt Williams, who had a very good game against the Tigers, uh, 20 points, 
five of eight from three point range. All of his attempts were from three point range, and uh, BJ, of course, was sixteen and seven and two assists. But um, you know, it, it would have been nice to sort of piggyback that game, that home game against Memphis, with a win, you know, against Cincinnati. But you know, that's that's a tough ask going up there and, and playing that team right now. They're having a hell of a season, Cincinnati. They deserve a lot of credit. So, uh, like you said, we looking looking at the schedule right now, Eric. Here's how it shakes out. You got two home games coming up, two big home games. UConn right now on Saturday, February the 11th, which uh, UConn is right behind us in the standings at six and five, 11 and 12 overall. Got off to a slow start. They're starting to they're starting to pick it back up. Then Tulsa comes to town on Valentine's Day on Valentine's night, Tuesday uh, Tuesday February 14th, 7 p.m. Uh, Tulsa right now is just above us in the standings. Uh, at six, at, at, or right now at six and five, twelve and eleven overall. So this is the this is the key stretch in th- this key home stand. This is the biggest home stand of the year, I would say. You got these two teams right around you in the standings. If you can beat them both, and I think you got to beat them both. If you can beat them both, you're going to be in very good shape uh, coming through. You know, you at least get in, get yourself into the top five. Maybe you catch a little bit of momentum, and you can sneak into the top four in the conference standings. Well, and you're kind of through that rough stretch of the schedule. I mean, this has been a rough stretch. It really for, has. You know, look at all the road games they've had to do, all the travel. Remember, this team is still flying commercial. And uh, so this was the fourth that, game of the the Cincinnati game is the fourth game in their last six on the road. Yeah. So, you know, they got to take care of You're right. They got to see what they're going to do here at home. And uh, so we'll see how it happens with that. But. Uh, starts with UConn. That's not going to be easy because UConn matches up well with UCF because they have the size and physicality still, even with all the injuries that gives Taco some issues uh, internally. That's what we saw in the first matchup. So, yeah. you know, we'll see how they kind of react to that. And uh, But look, I mean, they got three, what, three home games left the whole year? Uh, yeah, you know, three, with UConn, UConn, Tulsa, and then the last one is against Cincinnati, Cincinnati. February 26th, yeah. But you're right. These two games will be pivotal because it could be the difference between fourth and fifth place and maybe seventh place. So uh, we'll see how they respond to that. And I think the guys will be happy to be home and uh, for a little stretch and go from there. And you try to finish strong going into the conference tournament. I think that's the goal with this team. I still think if they could finish strong this year, they have a shot to make a postseason, whether it be an NIT or a CBI. Are, are we seeing really the attrition from you know the lack of depth really hit right now because even though they're not missing anyone per se due to injury, you know they you know so it, it looked like we just didn't have enough gas in the tank. Sure, I mean that's a pos- that's part of it. We've said that all year long. So uh, you know they're up against it, you know, especially when you're facing some of the top teams like Cincinnati. I mean this is maybe. Mick Cronin's best Cincinnati team. And this is probably the best Cincinnati team, by the way. So it's the Bob Huggins Cincinnati team. So they yeah, might be uh, right. Be- Kenyon Martin and uh, James yeah, Patterson, because some of those guys, the thing about this Cincinnati team, and they mentioned it on the telecast is that they not only can they defend, but they can score. That's kind of been the issue with Cincinnati in the, in the last few years is they've been more of a defensive team, not really a great offensive team. Well, that's different. And you've mentioned it. They're not dependent on one or two guys. They have a lot of different ways they could score. And so, uh, you know, you're right. That's where the conference, you get exposed. I've always believed in college basketball, especially uh, you get exposed more in the conference and, uh, and, and all your weaknesses and uh, issues kind of get uh, hit a little bit. And yeah, the lack of depth is certainly a, Take it, it's told a little bit here for UCF. Cronin, by the way, at Cincinnati has won 20 games every year since 2010 2011. That year he went 26 and 9. They were 27 and 7 in, in 2013 2014. Um, Huggins, uh, Huggy Bear, as we like to call him, uh, he had that 31 and 4 year in 01 02, um, went, but they got knocked out in the second round. That was his best season. Um, at that was his best season at, at when they were in the when they were in Conference USA Cincinnati. So, um, although he had a lot of twenty sixes and twenty sevens, he had a twenty nine and four in two thousand. He had a twenty eight and five, twenty seven and five, twenty nine and five back in nineteen ninety one when they were in the Great Midwest. Um, 
Yeah, and that was the year they actually they made the Final Four, too. Uh, it, was, it was in 92. So, But um, credit to Cincinnati, credit to Mick Cronin, who has um, just done an outstanding job. His first year there, by the way, they were 11-19 and 19 overall and 2-14 and 14 in the Big East, finished in 16th place. And he's got them back to where they, can, where, they, where they feel that they rightly are. So this was a good gut check game for UCF and Johnny Dawkins because you know, Cincinnati right now is where UCF, I think, wants to be eventually. It's going to take a little while for them to get there. Hopefully it won't take too much longer. But I think they learn real quick you know, how, this, how, the, how a great team plays. And they don't play well. They still find a way to win. And they defend the home court. So... Uh, and then again, like we said, we're going to be, you know, we have this little little mini home stretch. These last two home games are absolutely positively critical for UCF uh, men's basketball. All right, switching gears over to women's basketball. They, boy, did they dispose of Houston tonight, by the way. We're recording this again, Wednesday night. Final score, 85-59. UCF just wipes out the Cougars. Uh, leading the way for uh, UCF uh, on the individual stat sheet. Uh, by the way, Ashley Polachek again got the st- uh, got the start for UCF, um, but leading the way for um, the Knights, boy, they got some two huge performances tonight. Zai Lewis with twenty nine points on eleven of twenty two from the field, and then Aaliyah Gregory. 28 points on, on 11 of 17. Uh, Zai, by the way, was 6 of 14 from the three-point arc. So you got those two players combining for 57 points uh, of the Knights' 85, which is actually, you know, you know, obviously that's a high percentage, but, you know, not too bad overall, you know, considering, you know, Fifi and Dorr had nine. Uh, uh, K.K. Wright had uh, eight points as well to go with two assists. Um, rebounding wise, Aaliyah Gregory also pulled down seven, uh, seven boards, eight assists for Ashley Polachek, who got the start, uh, at the point, uh, today, but, uh, wow, what a performance by those two, Gregory and Lewis, who have, um, you know, in this lineup, you know, with Ashley Polachek, I think running the point, Eric, which I think is the key. She played 22 minutes, Wright played 18, um, but she kind of gets things started. And when you do, if you can get those two players started, Gregory and Lewis, um, things can get out of hand if, in a hurry if you're the opposing team. The Knights uh, shot 33 of 61 from the field and held Houston to just 19 of 45. So consider the the, the double threat on offense with Zai and Aaliyah, and then the and then on defense you hold your opponent to 16 fewer shot attempts than you got. That's an impressive performance. Well, there's a few things. I believe that's the most points UCF has scored all year. Number one. Yep, and number points. two, how many? And Gregory, how many points she had again? Gregory had. I just pulled out of it. Okay, here it is. Uh, Gregory had twenty-eight. Season high. Yeah. Uh, for Gregory, uh, her previous was twenty-five uh, against Tulsa. And you know, look, we've just discussed this with Lewis and Gregory. They account for almost over forty percent of this offensive scoring. So the fact that they both were on tells you how lethal they can be. And then that's the thing. And that's everything was clicking for them offensively. And that's a big bounce back. Cause I know that there was a bit of a disappointment on Saturday at SMU. They struggled offensively. They got off to a quick start in that first quarter and then they couldn't buy a basket the rest of that half. And, um, they fought back, but then lost by five. So, um, you know, that that's been their issues at times putting the ball in the basket, but certainly Lewis and Gregory had it going to uh, on Wednesday night. And, uh, when they do that, that that makes UCF a completely different team because they've been able to defend well for the most part this year. Uh, as far as Polachek starting, look, uh, Coach Abe, one thing she uh, I've noticed, she she will go based on I mean matchups. Um, she will change lineups at a at a moment's notice. I don't. I think she looks at every game differently, and I think she says, okay, who gives us our best shot to win and go based on matchups? You know, you always see that a lot in baseball about, well, I'm going to put in this lefty hitter against the righty, or I'm going to put a righty hitter against the lefty. Maybe I'm going to sit a lineup a certain way against a pitcher. You know, in football, maybe you go a certain stuff. I think I think, I think, Coach James doing that a little bit with basketball in that, okay, who gives me the best shot here to get off to a good start from a starting five standpoint against a specific opponent? And, 
you know, Polachek gets to start and, and uh, boy, it clicked today. But I don't know if that guarantee she'll start the next game. But uh, very positive to bounce back and get home because now they got to go on the road and take on Tulsa on the digital network on Saturday. That will not be an easy trip against the Tulsa team that I actually saw them play in person, and uh, you saw them. Uh, they hit threes against UCF. Uh, yeah. hit them and, and hit them a lot, you know, when they played earlier this year. So, you know, that's going to be the challenge there. They lost 73-62 to Tulsa back on January 21st. So can they maintain and, and the Tulsa three-point shooting, which was surprising because Tulsa was not really a great three-point shooting team coming into that game, but uh, they were that day. So that'll be the challenge for UCF. I know Coach Abe was not happy with their intensity leading into that game. So it'll be interesting how they react after losing the first time against Tulsa. Not to mention the fact that right after that, uh, right after that Tulsa game, they got to face uh, USF on Valentine's Day too on Tuesday. And um, you know, we mentioned last week I saw that team up close and personal, um, doing work with the American Digital Network in the Sun Dome. Uh, it's the only time UCF and USF are playing in women's basketball this year. The schedule worked out that way. But, boy, speaking of teams that can shoot, oh, man, USF can shoot. And uh, it, and they are going to be a serious problem because it's like playing the Golden State Warriors, the way that they, the way that Coach Fernandez run, runs, his, runs his scheme. So uh, I'm going to be interested to see if Coach Abe's sort of strategy that she employed against UConn, where she basically slowed the game down intentionally, uh, I'm going to be interested to see if that works. Cincinnati was the team that I saw them play against, and, and Cincinnati tried to run with them, and that just wasn't going to work. So uh, I'm interested to see how that um, will play out um, going forward. Right now, UCF, if you look at the conference standings, pretty far down right now, in three and six in the league, that's ninth. But there's a big crowd around four and six, five and five, six and four, Um you know, consider obviously UConn's eleven and 23. They won ninety eight games in a row, which is unbelievable. Uh, Temple at eight and two, USF at seven and two in third. Both of those teams at eighteen wins overall. Uh, the Knights have thirteen wins overall. They're thirteen and nine. So um, to put that into comparison, SMU's three spots ahead of them uh, in the conference standings because they're a half game ahead of them in the ahead of the Knights in the win column at four and six. But they also have thirteen wins. Uh, Cincinnati ahead of them at five and five in the American, fourteen wins. So, when you put the context together, um, UCF has kind of just fallen on some bad luck in the uh, in the re- in the uh, American Athletic Conference play, and, they, and it's not going to get any easier. Obviously, you know they got off to sort of that slow start, hovering around the UConn game. Remember, they lost to Cincinnati and then Memphis, uh, and then you mentioned the loss to uh, that mentioned that they lost those two in a row prior to these prior to this Houston game, but um, chance for them to actually step things up here in the last, uh, as they head down the stretch here in sort of this last half of the conference schedule. They got some uh, teams right around them in the standings coming up. East Carolina is not having a very good year. They're one and nine in the conference. We got them at home. Uh, Tulane, uh, they have to travel to New Orleans for that game. Tulane is at six and four in the league, fourth over, fourth in the American. And then they got SMU and uh, Temple after that. So, um, Chance down the stretch to maybe make a little bit of noise. Uh, you can get into the conference tournament that way, um, but they're going to have to hustle, I think, to keep things up. And, but I'm really impressed with, like you said, how Aaliyah Gregory has uh, stepped it up uh, in particular. And Coach Abe talked about that. You know, remember um, a couple weeks ago, you know, we, we had that soundbite from her about how good Aaliyah has been and how good she thought she would be. Uh, and that certainly has, uh, has shown itself, especially in this game, as she has – you know, it's good to see how she and Aaliyah have picked up the scoring. And you kind of have that chance that... And Aaliyah has that um, mid-range game that I think is so deadly. She reminds me so much of Reggie Miller sometimes in that... Or, excuse me, not Reggie Miller, Richie, Richard Hamilton um, in that respect. You know, so, and, and we saw that in that in that Tulsa game on full display. So, um, again, tough stretch coming up for uh, UCF uh, women's basketball, but... Uh, let's see if they can get through it and finish up strong here uh, in Coach Abe's first season. All right. So as we finish up here uh, in, in this segment, stick around because coming up next, we have a, a very special interview. We're going to preview UCF softball uh, with head, head coach Renee Lures Gillespie entering her 16th season. Plus, we have a look at UCF golf for the first time and tennis 
quick update on women's tennis as well. Stick around. The Black and Gold Back Banneret podcast is back after this. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley. This is Trey Strelka with the UCF Nightline Podcast, the original, the number one rated UCF sports podcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On Twitter, it's UCF underscore Nightline and at www.ucfnightlinepodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to us as well on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And when you get sick of listening to these guys, make sure you look us up. Don't forget, that's the UCF Nightline Podcast. Go Knights! Charge on. Now, back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. And welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez with you. Let's switch gears over to softball. We've got, you know, our spring sports are firing up, Eric Lopez. And, uh, of course, if it's softball season, that means it is Eric Lopez's favorite time of year, isn't it? It is, and it means the busiest time of year. But it's a fun time of year, absolutely. Uh, game week, can't believe it, ready to roll. It seems like uh, off season blew by fast, but uh, a lot of new faces this year. A lot of new faces to uh, get to be uh, to be introduced to night fans, and I think that's kind of the intriguing part about this year. There's a little bit more unknown than maybe there has been in the last couple of years with the team. Well, we we've, we've been spoiled the last really four seasons with Shelby Turnier and uh, and Mackenzie Otis before her, and the Uvari sisters as well. Now that all of them are gone, now they you know so. Is uh, it, there is a tough schedule? The season, by the way, starts Friday, February tenth, with two games uh, in the home tournament uh, against FAMU at three thirty. That's the season opener against Florida A and M. Friday, February tenth at three thirty at the UCF softball complex, the newly um, updated UCF softball complex. By the way, they, we try right, baby. Uh, they have the seat backs now and a couple upgrades elsewhere in the park, and then also they play Pitt. Uh, in this tournament on Friday at 6 p.m. So as you're heading home from work after Friday, stop by the park, root on the Knights as they take on Pitt. Uh, also, Kentucky is in this tournament. The Knights play them at 3.30 on Saturday, too. So, uh, And then they have uh, one more against FAMU on Saturday, and then they play Pitt again at 11.30 a.m. on Sunday. So uh, a lot going on for the Knights uh, on the softball diamond. And, uh, you know, like you said, I mean, there are some key returners, obviously, coming back, but... Y- Man, have we been spoiled the last four years or what? Well, it's been a great run. It's been the best run of the softball program to this uh, point. With uh, When you look at it going back to really 2012, if you will, uh, this program's been to the NCAA tournament for the last five years, been to the regional finals three straight years, a lot of wins, top 25s to a couple of conference regular season championships, conference tournament championships, so uh, a great era. But, you know, a lot of them are gone. Uh, You mentioned Audis and Shelby, who is now coaching at UNF. You mentioned the Yavari sister, Samantha McClowski, who hit the home run to win the championship in the 2015 title game against Tulsa. She graduated. So a lot of young faces, especially pitching. That'll be obviously the question. I mean, let's be honest. I think UCF softball is really the identity, if you will, uh, has been pitching. So that is who's the next one. How do you kind of fill the gap there? You know, offensively. You know, they do return a lot of young players. Brittany Solis, the senior at shortstop, returns. Ledea Goodman, a senior left field, returns. Willow Callen in the right fielder, returns. Uh, you've got Courtney Roten, the third baseman, who started the last uh, couple of years there, last year, I should say. Uh, she returns. Uh, you've got Cassidy Brewer, who's the American Conference freshman of the year. She returns. So offensively and skill-wise, they've got a lot of returners. They're just very young. Uh, you know, behind the plate, Autumn Gillespie, Jeff, wait till you see her. Uh, she played a little bit of last year before she got hurt, missed the most of uh, the second half of the year. The best arm I've ever seen a catcher have at UCF. Really? Uh, she is a weapon behind the plate. And so it'll be great to have her back fully healthy uh, on this team. So, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement from a skill position standpoint. Corey Hill, new assistant in uh, from Texas, a great hitting coach. I think will do wonders for the the young girls. So the question's going to be pitching. Obviously, there's one returning pitcher, Miami Calixto, who's a senior. She transferred last year from Miami Dade. Pitched last year was the number three uh, times number two, um, more of an off speed pitcher. And then you've got three freshman pitchers on staff, and that's going to be interesting with a young staff. How quickly do they learn this high level? And uh, you know that's going to be they're going to be tested early. You mentioned that schedule. In the opening weekend, Kentucky's a top 25 team in the country. So 
Uh, they are a, a perennial top 25 program. Pittsburgh made the NCAA tournament a couple of years ago, just missed uh, last year. So not uh, they're going to get off to a tough schedule. Then they go out to California for the Mary Nutter tournament, and then they go to Alabama. So uh, they'll learn quick. Um, it'll be interesting how uh, they kind of learn the grasp, if you will, and who steps up from a pitching standpoint. Uh, but I can tell you, being around them a little bit, uh, they're, it's a very close team, and uh, I think they're excited to. Uh, I think for this year, and I think they're excited to prove a, a point. Sometimes with uh, with young players, they're they're hungry and they want to. You know, they know they got to make a name for themselves, and uh, certainly I think we have a lot of that. So it's going to be interesting to see how they uh, come out this year. Well, head coach Renee Lourdes Gillespie has seen it all, and she's heading into now her 16th season. Is that right, Eric? 16 seasons. 16 seasons since she started the program in 2002. Uh, this is my 11th season. So I've seen most of it, but right. not all of it like she has. And, between you uh, well, and I, we've seen pretty much every, pretty yeah. much all of UCF softball. Between you know, When I was a student, we actually started doing play-by-play on a tape-delay basis back when we were freshmen. And uh, and you've done, of course, you know, so many softball games over there. You're approaching 400, my friend. I've done. Yeah, I did the numbers the other week. It was uh, 393 games I've done, 303 at the complex, 393 overall. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of crazy. I started off in 07 as a student and, you yeah, know, I never thought I would be here still today doing it. It just kind of happened. It's one of those uh, fluky things. But I've seen a lot of great games, a lot of great players and always interesting storylines. And, you know, for coach, uh, nothing new. I mean, it, it, it's a lot of young players, but she's gone through this before. It reminds me a lot, Jeff, of 2012 where there was a lot of new uh, freshmen. Uh, Mackenzie Otis was the freshman. Kaylee Novak was a freshman. Maddie Schroeder was a freshman. Ferris Sullivan was a freshman. Uh, so that was a new team. And and Mackenzie Otis had the big year, freshman, uh, a monster year, one pitcher of the year, and they made the tournament. So it's not the first time this program has had to kind of kind of get some new faces in there to step up. That's been part of the tradition, and I don't think it'll be any different this year. I know they're excited about the talent potential. I don't think the talent is the question from a standpoint it's just the experience and how quick quickly they grasp uh you know the competition and then improve all right so let's so we were lucky enough on uh this past monday to uh to take a look at uh to head over to ucf softball and meet up with coach gillespie we went around took a look at some of the new things that were going on at the park and it's always good to spend time with coach you know especially before the season starts and she gave us a little bit of preview on her end what she's expecting from her team this year. So without further ado, here is our interview with UCF softball head coach Renee Lures Gillespie. And joining us now in her 16th season as you, the only softball coach that UCF has ever had, when, has ever had, which is my favorite way of saying it. She's been a good friend of myself and Eric for forever, going back to when we were freshmen here. And um, championships all over the place, banners, a gazillion wins. Um, Renee Lourdes Gillespie joining us to talk UCF softball in, uh, in what I'm sure Jim Nance would call a tradition unlike any other. How are you, Coach? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Eric. Well, we have um, – so this year, the Uvari twins are gone. Uh, Shelby's gone. A lot of new faces this year. So, um, all right, so, so I'm going to ask you the really, the really reportery question. Is this a rebuilding year or a reloading year? I, I believe it's reloading because we have such a great group of young freshmen this year. Um, you know, we lost 10 seniors last year, but um, reloaded with some fantastic freshmen. And our upperclassmen are strong with, with Brittany Solis and Lenny coming back. And Ma came in as a transfer. And they're just going to be really strong as, as, a, as a senior class. You know, Willow has been with us for, for two years or three years as a transfer. And um, you just see these girls kind of stepping up and being really good leaders for us. You, seeing the team around in UCF events all fall, it seems a very tight group, too, right? You get a sense, too, there's a good bond with this this team because of the leadership of Britton Linnell? Yeah, you definitely see that. Um, this is probably the tightest group we've had in 16 years. Um, they, they really are fighting for each other. You know, I wouldn't say we have one standout All-American out there yet. Um, I think we're still very young for that, but I think that the group that we have is very strong together, and I think that's going to win a lot of games for us this year. Plus, there's a sense, I feel, of hungriness. Because they're such a young team, there's a lot of players got to prove themselves, whereas, you know, the last couple years, you had players that have already accomplished a lot, so there's not that urgency that maybe you have with this group. 
Yeah, I think if you look across the, the board for infield, I mean, there's there's really not one position that's locked out right now. Um, you know, besides Autumn that's coming back as a redshirt freshman last year behind the plate, um, it's really a battle in every every single spot. And we have so many different options to be able to move them in and out of different positions because it's a very versatile group of kids that we have this year. Um, and that's going to be fun for us. I mean, we get a chance to, to really kind of move them around and, and see what the best best fit is. Let's talk pitching because I know how much you like to talk about that. Calixto is your only senior coming back who, in the circle, but you got some talent around you, and they've got some big shoes to fill, don't they? I really do. I mean, you, you look at Shelby leaving and, and playing and winning the national championship for, for you know Chicago Bandits. You know, she was a, a big loss for us last year. Uh, Ma coming in, she's excited about this. She's getting excited about kind of take the reins and and uh, Aaliyah coming in as a freshman and Cam coming in as a freshman and Demera um, out of Canada. Um, those those four pitchers, I think, will be a pitching staff. Um, I don't see one just stepping up and and taking all of the the games. I think they're going to be working together and and really working together as a team. You mentioned Shelby. She's now coaching at UNF. You have Mackenzie Hoon coaching at Palm Beach Atlantic. You've got Jessica Yavari being a volunteer coach at Stetson. One of your own, Kaylee Novak's back with the program, volunteer coach at UCF. Lindsay Enders, who pitched for you, Jeff covered you, you covered her, is now a head coach at Stratford. You know, that tree continues to kind of grow now countrywide there. Yeah, excited about that. I mean, as a coach, you, you hope that you're passing down a – a good feel and a, and a love for this game, and and when you see the the players wanting to go on and and give back and become coaches, um, that that warms your heart. You realize they're doing something right. You know, it's not all about the wins and losses. It's about you know making good people and making good choices for um, for what they want to do. And and I really feel like coaching is giving back to to the next generation. Offensively, you lose Yavari, you lose McClowski up the middle in the bat, but you've mentioned you've got a lot of depth and a lot of options you could kind of mix and match. You mentioned Autumn Gillespie's back. You've got Brewer back, Cassidy Brewer's a rookie, off rookie in the American Conference Freshman of the Year. You've got Courtney Roten. I mean, there seems to be a lot of depth, more depth. There's a lot of depth one to nine. Maybe you don't have that, quote, one superstar hitter, but you've got a lot of depth here, don't you? Oh, absolutely. In the lineup, we're, we're really excited about that. And, and bringing Corey Hill in from Texas, I mean, she was a great addition for us. Um, you, you see these girls really buying in to, to what she's teaching them, and, and you're seeing them hitting better than, than I ever imagined them being able to hit this year. Um, yeah, like Brittany Solis, you know, she's just lighting it up right now, you know, as, as our starting shortstop last year and, and hitting, you know, two, three in that lineup um, last year. She, she's really stepping up as a senior. Um, Courtney, always a big bat. Uh, Brewer, always a big bat. Um, you're looking at some of the freshmen, too, on being able to, to step in. I mean, you've got um, Jazz is playing first base for us right now. Um, um, Aubrey's at second base, also behind Brewer. Actually, they're kind of battling it out right now, but, but she's coming up very solid, um, coming in from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you have, and you look at Tamisha. Tamisha, oh my gosh, this, she was a redshirt last year too as a freshman, and and coming in, and she's playing third and short for us. But she's she's probably one of the the biggest surprises for us this year is just how how big of a bat she has, and and she's going to do some damage out there for us. Schedule's challenging once again this year because you, you know three home tournaments, which is always good. But you're going you're going to the Mary Nutter once again, which is which is you know I mean that's a gauntlet as always. And you also have that tournament up in Alabama, and we got some full, we got some really good teams coming in here. So, um, what are the key games that you're looking at to see? You know, okay, this is this is where I think we're going to be as far as the season goes. It's tough to say because with as young of a team we are, we're kind of saying this is game one, game two, game three. We we don't want them to get these. Um, big eyes on on seeing the teams and looking too far ahead. So this weekend we've got Florida A and M as we're starting the games off our opening opening game, um, and then we come back with Pitt and and um, um, Kentucky. And you know, so it's going to be a, a very tough weekend for us even to start off with. Um, but you're looking at the Mary Nutter that we're looking at. You know, UCLA and Cal. You know, big two big things. Loyola M- M- Marymount, she, the very tough program and. Cal Poly, you know, those are going to be a, a very big challenging weekend for us and then turn around and going back up to Alabama playing them in two games and Texas Tech you know, so it's going to be a, a challenging first three weeks, um, but that's what we want. We want the girls to kind of see where they need to be and, and kind of initiate our freshmen to, to realize, you know, this is Division One, and we're looking for a chance for the World Series and, and we've got to be able to play up with the big boys. What does it speak to your program? You mentioned the tough schedule. Always played a tough schedule, but usually it was on a neutral field. You had to go on the road to get 
expect those teams to play to play you. Now you've got Kentucky coming to your house. You got Georgia coming in to your house. You've got Baylor coming in for a three game series. Uh, so it, it, it goes on and on. So teams, the top teams now are coming to your place and playing in your tournaments. That's you got to be proud of the fact that now team the top teams feel yeah let, that's one of the top programs. Let's go down there and play and we'll get better for it. Yeah, I think I think that shows a lot about what we've established here at UCF. Um, we, we've really worked hard to be able to be in the top twenty-five every year, and and you know we didn't get that preseason mark. You know we we're still in the vote. We're just on the the cusp of being the top twenty-five, but that that's telling us that the teams are excited about coming down and, and playing us. That we are giving them RPIs, and um, you know we we are the team to to challenge. Um, we we kind of always like to be the underdog. I think it's it helps us out. You know we got preseason ranked as third in our conference. Even though we've we've um, taken two of three games in every single conference school across the schedule, so um, you know we're still looking kind of the underdog, and that's okay. You know we're we're going to come out, we're going to show them what we're about, and and that's the exciting part of having these big teams coming into our home side is being able to get the crowds out there and get them excited about about our sport. Interesting year in the American Conference. You got Tulsa as the defending conference tournament champions. They lose Caitlin Sill, who graduated. Their number one pitchers. South Florida won the regular season last year. Erica Nunn graduated. She was the American pitcher of the year. You lose Shelby. I mean, it seems like uh, it's a it's a young league this year, which could you know obviously a lot of bats coming back, some questions pitching. People have got to grow, but it could be a wild year from top to bottom here. Oh, I absolutely think you're right. It's it's going to be um, probably a high scoring conference games <laughs> every single weekend because you're right that the top pitches that we've all had the last last three years um, are gone now, and you know even Mackenzie. Um, when she left, it was it was a hole, and Shelby filled that hole for us. So we'll have to see who comes up and who fills that hole for us. Um, but also with the other teams, with the other conference teams, on who's going to be that one person that's going to come up and, and be that number one pitcher for us. Because I really do believe it's going to be pitching by committee this year for all the teams. And that's where the sport's been going. It's been more by, by the staff committee, right? I mean, that's I mean, even Oklahoma won the national title. Paige Parker carried him, but they needed another pitcher pitching the World Series. So that's where the sport is now. It's more of a committee now. It, it really is. I mean, you, you look at Texas A&M, same thing. Um, LSU, same thing. You know, you, you have to have a, a great um, – team of of pitchers to be able to get through and and the end of the hitters are getting better I mean that's what you're seeing you you can't go in with one pitcher and expect her to go two three games on the same team they, they're going to pick up what she's throwing and they're going to make adjustments so it's important to have that that committee of pitchers that's going to be able to take you through that game what's the key you've coached veteran teams you've coached young teams what's the key as far as the message to them does your approach change at all with a younger team like this compared to a veteran team you had last year I think it does a little bit. I mean, just like we're we're looking at it's going game to game. It's going to be how we play, not how the other team plays. I think once you get in the mode of, of freshmen and, and the bright eyes and, and the World Series and they were at the World Series, you start seeing that kind of situation happen where they, they get in awe. Well, you got to realize that we have to play our game. When we go out there, the freshmen have to realize we do our part and we're going to end up winning games. That's the, that's the end result, but we got to stay in the process, stay in the one pitch at a time and focus on what we're doing right. What's going to be the key you know, between now and then the season gets going? and think It's a marathon. It's a long season. There's always ups and downs. But what are a couple of the keys for the team there to kind of accomplish your internal goals? I think just staying within themselves. Um, a, a lot of what we focused on, and especially in the last four weeks, five weeks, is um, staying focused on on doing the little things right, um, taking care of the ball, making sure that that we're there for each other when when things aren't going exactly the way you want it. It's okay. It's the next pitch. It's it's focusing on what's coming up um, and not looking behind and. I think we're focused a lot on that, especially with the freshmen and this and the season. I mean, you can't go into a game thinking that so and so is going to be unbelievable as, as a team because they're top 25. Just like we lost Shelby last year and, and South Florida and Tulsa, um, they lose players too, and they have new freshmen coming in. So it's it's you know anyone's game. Head coach Renee Lures Gillespie, opening day February 10th, and they got then you got two games on that day, FAMU and Pitt to start off the season. And uh, thanks once again for joining. I, I mean, I we've been around the program for so long, as you know, yes. you know, going back to when we were students, and and it's it's always nice because we know springtime is happening when it's softball season. So thanks again for spending time with us, and I'm sure we'll catch up again as the uh, year goes by. Thank you, guys, and you know it's been 16 years with you guys, and I hope it's going to be another 16 years. Thanks. Here's here's to that. Thanks, Coach. <laughs> Thank you. And our thanks again to Coach, and also thanks to Nate Blythe for uh, helping us out. 
uh, setting up this interview with Coach, and uh, it's always fun to. Do. I mean, she's been she's she's known us for you know so long that this is you know this is pretty easy, you know for you know what how, in terms of how you know this this whole thing this season works out. I think, and you know we're it's funny no like question. afterwards we were flipping through some old media guys and catching up on what some of the some of her old players are are up to these days and. Um, and that's always fun. So, and and actually, I, ha- I happen to be lucky enough to run into one of them, one of the original knights from that 2002 team, Janae Shinoster, who um, <clears throat> who now does uh, work with the team um, in terms of physical therapy and massage therapy and everything. And she's, um, yeah, and that, that's what I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that's what she studied at UCF, and she's still doing it. She's part of, um, she's part of doing that with the team, and that's always fun to see that you know that coach always keeps. You know, a, a lot of her uh, former players sort of still in the loop. You know, I mean, we, we obviously know how successful, for example, Stephanie Best has been with Pro Swings, her um, her uh, her business. Um, and, you know, we've seen a, a bunch of former players actually come through as an as assistant coaches and, and one more coming through this year now, too. Right. Yeah. Kaylee Novak will be uh, back as a volunteer coach, has played the last two seasons in the NPF with the Dallas Charge all-time stolen base leader uh, in a career and in steals at UCF, and now she's back as a volunteer coach. Uh, so that'll be exciting. It'll be exciting to uh, have her around again. I think that'll help the program. Her dad, Jeff, Tommy Novak, played UCF baseball, played baseball right. for the UCF in the mid-'80s for uh, Jay Berkman. It's a little family connection there. So uh, it, it runs in the family. But tremendous to have her around. And, you know, you mentioned Coach. How about this little nugget? Coach Gillespie's the only UCF coach in any sport that has won a conference championship in the A-Sun, Conference USA, and in the American Conference. That's good. I, that's, that's a fun nugget. I love that. And we, and we were there for basically all of them. I remember where I was there for the first one that we won in, in the program's fourth year, finally broke through at FAU, um, defeating the Owls in Boca to win the A-Sun title. Uh, yeah, you know, yep. you 2005. You were there for Conference USA and, of course, the American titles of UCF has won. So. Yeah, yep. 2008 was when they won in Houston against uh, Houston to win the Conference USA championship. And, of course, uh, the 2014 and 2015, they won the regular season title in the American Conference, winning the tournament at home against Tulsa in 2015. So it tells you she's been able to adapt, uh, you know, from conference to conference, from, group, you know, seniors leaving to groups, you name it. Uh, that tells you – or her way, her adapt, and even able to adapt during the season. You know, maybe things, you know, I've seen teams that get off to slow starts and then they kind of click a month later and uh, play their best softball at the end of the year, which is really what you want. You don't want to peak too early. So, right. uh, yeah, I think she's excited. I think she likes the chemistry in this team, and, uh, you know, she'll. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it's a tough schedule, but again, as we met, you heard in the interview, it tells you. I mean, they're what they're a national program now, and with that means a lot of top competition, and a lot of teams are going to play each other. And, and the the exciting thing is that they want to come here as well now. As, as we talked about, mentioned in that interview, it used to be that teams you have to go places to find games, and now UCF's gotten the respect and the way they've hosted tournaments that some of the top teams want to come here to play because they know they're going to get quality soft uh, competition. So uh, it's, a, it's an exciting time for the program. You're right about alumni and former players coming in. There will be uh, some former players coming in throughout the year. And uh, it, it's always fun and exciting. And it's going to be interesting because, like, the American Conference, it's kind of – it's an interesting year. It's a young uh, league this year because a lot of graduation, especially in the pitching department. So – you know, you, we've talked about UCF, you know, Shelby graduating and, and, of course, playing in the NPF. Well, USF, who won the regular season title, Erica Nunn graduated. She moved on. So who steps up there? Tulsa lost Caitlin Sills. They were sort of number one pitcher. Who steps up there? Probably Watson was the number two last year. So um, it's a very interesting league this year from that standpoint is that there's some questions around the league. And I think it makes it for a very – uh, interesting race 2017 edition of the American Conference, a league that's proven to be a two to three bid league in the NCAA's. Yeah, and here's hoping that they'll be able to do the same this year. It'll be, it'll be, it, it's going to be. Uh, it seems like it's going to be quite. I don't, I don't know if mixed up is quite the right word, but there's going to be. Uh, it's going, it could be a wide open race in the American. So we'll be following that, and we both will be 
uh, there for the opening weekend, at least the first two days, Friday and Saturday. You'll be doing play-by-play on UCFnights.tv. I'll be doing PA in the softball complex. So that'll be fun. Make yeah. sure you check that out if you have the chance. Uh, Friday, 3.30 and 6. Saturday, 3.30 and 6. Sunday at 11 a.m. So, all right. So let's uh, let, let's check out what else we got going on here. We had some... Uh, other spring sports to talk about tennis. Uh, women's tennis won both of their matches over the past uh, week since our last show. They beat Florida A and M seven nothing, and then beat Georgia Southern uh, five to two. Um, Courtney Cesarini of uh, UCF was named the American Player of the Week. Uh, went two and zero in uh, both doubles and singles for the Knights. Um, she's a native of uh, Lower Gwinnett, Pennsylvania, and uh, she got the job done for UCF. So uh, UCF women's tennis, you know, we talked about men's tennis, how good of a job they're, uh, they're doing at this moment. Women's tennis is off to a 6-1 and one start. Their only loss was to the University of Iowa. Coming up for the Knights, they have, uh, they're at UNF in Jacksonville um, Wednesday, February 15th. Uh, and then they're back home for Florida Gulf Coast on February 17th. That's a Friday, and that's at the USTA uh, National Campus. As far as the men are concerned, uh, they are still 4-1. and one. They're still tra- waiting to get back on track. They had this long break. Their last match was January 29th against Bethune-Cookman. They don't play again until February 17th against uh, Tennessee Tech. But, hey, women's tennis getting, on, uh, uh, getting off to a real good start, Eric. Yeah, I mean, we've spent some t- so much time on the men's tennis with John Roddick, but remember, he made the hire for the women's tennis coach program, and it's not just the men's program, and they're both off to good starts. And, you know, could it be that we get two tennis programs in the postseason? It's too early for that, obviously, but uh, certainly positive signs off to a good start and playing to their max. So uh, it, it's you could definitely the impact is uh, being felt. And uh, shout-out to Brian Kaneko, who's the head coach of the women's tennis team, uh, for getting the job done uh, so far in this uh, early going. So Also, we had some golf to talk about, Eric Lopez. Uh, Ashley Holder of UCF named American Athletic Conference Women's Golf Player of the Week. She finished tied for 10th at the uh, UCF Challenge, a tournament where UCF finished in third place. Uh, But Ashley finished the uh, weekend... Uh, five under par. She shot a 67 the first day. It was a three-round tournament. Uh, and then finished up the tournament with a 69. Uh, 11 birdies, 39 par, so not bad at all um, as the Knights finished in third place. The Knights, by the way, ranked number 17 in the country in uh, women's golf. Uh, Emily Marin, of course, the head coach. Uh, there were nine other ranked opponents in the field, including Miami, who was ranked number 10. Kent State was number 15. Texas is number 19. Uh, and then, uh, so, uh, you know, hey, props to Ashley, who was 2014 American Athletic Conference Freshman of the Year and was back-to-back, uh, or, or excuse me, uh, it, it, it was back, or she was back-to-back American Athletic Conference Golfer of the Year in 2014 and 2015. She's been to the, uh, the regionals and the NCAA last season, uh, so she's right back to her, uh, back to her old tricks again, so... Uh, women's golf should be a lot of fun with head coach Emily Marin leading the way as well. So uh, as we finish up here, Eric, uh, what do you have coming up this week? Well, you mentioned it. I'll be at the softball complex all weekend uh, broadcasting starting Friday, home opener, season opener, 3.30 against FAMU. Then you got Pittsburgh on Friday. And then the Saturdays, you mentioned the big one, Kentucky, ranked 20th in the country in one of the major polls. That's a 3.30 game. So for those UCF fans or are planning to go to the UCF basketball game against Connecticut. That's a six o'clock tip. So why don't you just swing by, check a little softball in the before heading over to basketball. If you want to do it, that's a pretty nice double dip. So I would just recommend that. So I'll be at softball weekend. Also though, make a note on the sports talk, Florida insider show this Saturday that I co-host uh, the show airs on 1080 Orlando, 11 AM to 1 PM. We will be joined by UCF baseball head coach, Greg Lovelady. Uh, now he's going to come on around 1240, 1245 Eastern. And we're going to talk about the baseball season 2017 and uh, looking forward to talking to Coach Lovelady about this team and uh, a team that I think could surprise some people. I know the expectations aren't high with some of the, the struggles or disappointments, if you will, the last couple of years, how things didn't go well. But uh, 
uh, I think Coach Lovelady and in, in kind of the early interactions I've had with him is uh, pretty positive about this team. And for anybody that suggests that uh, this is just kind of a throwaway year, uh, it's wrong. You're, you're mistaken. So I'm looking forward to Coach Lovelady being on the show on Saturday, uh, probably around 1245. That's the scheduled uh, time. He'll uh, we'll talk to him about the season and uh, kind of, you know, a former two time national champion in Miami, too. That's right. Some, and he's got some ties to the state as far as uh, the coaching tree of Jim Morris, which uh, I'm sure we'll bring up as well. So look forward to uh, talking to Coach. Looking forward to that, too. I also will be at those first two days for UCF doing PA for the night's games at the UCF softball complex. So that should be uh, a lot of fun. So as we wrap up here in the Black and Gold Banneret podcast, remember, don't forget to follow us uh, at UCF underscore Banneret. Also look us up on Facebook at Black and Gold Banneret. Uh, and uh, check us out at blackandgoldbanneret.com. You can follow me at Jeff underscore Sharon on Twitter. And Eric Lopez, people can follow you at Eric Lopez Elo. And don't forget also, uh, we'll be back again next week with plenty more news for you for UCF in the spring. Um, man, it just never stops. We're hitting sort of that spring sports equinox now with basketball hitting uh, hitting full stride and, and all the other uh, spring sports. Baseball so- baseball's right around the corner. Softball obviously getting started this weekend. And, of course, tennis and golf hitting full speed. So for Eric Lopez, uh, my name is Jeff Sharon. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. We'll catch you again next week. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.